on each other's nerves just by being ourselves. There's no cosmic conspiracy out there. This is Court to Court, your connection to what's happening in the federal courts around the country, providing information and ideas that will enhance your job and how the courts function. Now with today's program, Michael Burney. Welcome to the first edition of Court to Court in the new century. We'll continue to provide information to help you do your jobs and to facilitate the exchange of ideas among you and your colleagues. Today, we'll see deputy courts in action and learn how to deal with some of the confidential information in and out of the courthouse and hear about the importance of respect and communication. While the drama of the judicial system is often an important one, day in and day out, keeping the courts running smoothly is the work of the clerk's offices. And in any clerk's office, the deputy clerks provide the energy to make that happen. The Alexandria Division of the District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia is no exception. With several federal properties and highways under its jurisdiction, it's an office which handles everything from traffic tickets to spy cases. In our first segment, we'll hear from deputy clerks in their own words how they do their work and contributions to the court. My job and all other deputy clerks here in the clerk's office are the front line for the court. Everything that comes through this clerk's office is imperative to a judge's decision. Is that a problem I'll bring up right now? I consider my position as a quorum clerk literally the front lines. I am right there in contact with the defendants, with the attorneys, with the judge. We like to think of it as being the fulcrum for the entire uh, court system here. Everything flows through the clerk's office. Things begin here, they end here. Hi, Ms. Lee. This is Alice from the Federal Court in Alexandria. How can I help you? Uh, our case manager, docket clerks, handle intake duties as well as docketing duties, as well as filing, uh, handling phones. Yes, actually, you have to bring a card for that. Um, and then once the judge actually assesses a fine to him, he pays the fine, then he'll get that suspension on his license. A typical day, no, there isn't. <laughs> there is no typical day. You get called to the calendar to assist someone. And, you know, obviously, you have to stop what you're doing, you know, at your desk. And, and you're working overtime to resolve that. Um, we have attorneys come in. We have defendants themselves come in. We have the families of the defendants coming in. And they're coming in to us asking us a question um, or coming in with their problem and looking for an answer. Everybody gets an answer. We have you rescheduled, actually, to come in tomorrow at the court. somebody who comes in to us um, with their problem and they take all their frustration out on us. We simply just try to calm them down. We tell them that, you know, we'll find an answer for them. We'll get them to the right place. Give me a second. I have a, uh, a motion. It's an appeal from the bankruptcy court and it needs to be approved. So, is it every Friday? Do I put it on the advance? Do I give out the notice of hearing? Is, do we have the case here? The case is pending here? It's a protective notice that hasn't come up from the bankruptcy court. But the last time I did this, the bankruptcy court says we got to go to the Eastern District because it's an appeal. They don't have jurisdiction to deny the appeal. Yeah. There's, there's lots of pressure. <laughs> lots of pressure. Uh, and efficient to get what they need to them. When I come out of court, I have to have the warrants issued. I have to do the orders. I have to have the copies out because we're dealing with a time frame of one, one to three days. I don't leave anything in work for the next day because I know the next day is going to be a big one. And I always try to finish my work before we close the business. And that's okay when you have a couple of hearings in one day. But like yesterday on Tuesday, we're duty. 30 defendants in the morning, I 
needs to process all the paperwork and get the calls where they're supposed to go. An Article Three judges' courtroom pace is much slower. We don't have the traffic docket. We don't have the influx of people. It's much slower, and things take longer, just by the nature of the things that they hear. I like courtroom better because I like the arena. I like um, I like the orderliness of it. I like the um, watching a case unfold. Attorneys are fun to watch. Not always fun to listen to, but they're fun to watch. Um, I like working with a good judge. Down here, it is certainly meeting in the office. It is certainly more hectic. There's always somebody wanting a piece of you. The phones are ringing. There's someone at the counter. Somebody asking a question. Always a stack. have told us that they like that kind of a role. It gets them out of their seat. There's a lot of movement around the office. You're talking with a lot of clerks. Um, you're checking work. You're reviewing work with them to explain how to, to uh, enter data correctly or a new procedure. If you need to edit text, you go to the two to edit docket information. But what we're going to do is actually play around in case information, the type of um, docket. Go into one, edit case information. There's, there's never a dull moment. There's never a boring time. I just got this motion for relief uh, from a dismissal order. Um, it's been docketed. The case is on appeal. Does that need to go right back up to Judge Hilton and sign the dismissal order? No one knows everything, so uh, you, have, you have to ask to learn. And um, that's, how I, that's how I learned a lot. It's just by asking questions. So right. If they get consent from all sides. They still have to have it. If it's their motion, okay, that's going on in 1901, and then 30 different defendants, and they have to get signatures from all the other defendants. Well, are they wanting to put all motions to dismiss, or do this? No, just, just their one? two motions to dismiss. They have a motion to dismiss in this one, and a motion to dismiss in this one. Our data quality analyst uh, is very knowledgeable about docketing. Um, I go to her. I've gone to the division manager, the clerk himself. I've called judges with questions. Any way that I can find the best possible correct answer, I will go anywhere to find that. Yeah, I've just seen the things going, going to work, meeting different people all the time. The toughest kind of calls you probably would have to deal with are individuals who aren't willing to serve because of their jobs, which we understand. service here at the federal court now with Sandra, and if we have a person that's really, really inconsistent and don't really want to cooperate with us, then we go ahead and send a letter to the judge. The changes that I've noticed over my six years at working here in the court system is the volume of cases has increased substantially. Uh, and the second thing is the automation in the, uh, our system, technology. Believe it or not, when I started work here in October of 1989, I was handed a typewriter and docket sheets to type on. And um, I was very surprised because my previous job, I had my own personal computer. So that was a big shock. And so ICS docketing just changed everything. It, I think it, it was the best thing since sliced bread. So you're telling me that the, all this information is correct except she needs to modify yeah. that. Another change in more recent years is training. There is more training available for the clerks. And then you need to make sure that you come down here. This is your card change this date also. Does this point to other screens that you're talking about that you that change the text? text? Yeah, that'll come up next. Go ahead and change the date. For me, I think the most rewarding part of my job, I always feel a sense of um, accomplishment if I've been able to help someone either on the phone or at the counter. The most rewarding part of my job is learning something new every day. I would call counsel and tell them that they want to have it consolidated. They're going to have to 
and coordinate the exits. This is a very interesting job. Uh, you see different things float through here every day, different complaints. Um, you learn a lot about the different laws. The most rewarding part of my job, I feel, is that I have a significant role in the execution process in the judicial system. It's important that you're dealing with people's lives and their civil rights. I think the most rewarding part is actually when we get responses in return from customers who say thank you, they write us letters, um, or they come back in person just to say thank you, that we were able to help them solve their problems. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The people who work with me in the clerk's office are astoundingly good people. They do great. arising in our district, um, and these people, they get the job done. You need to be here at 2 o'clock because they only hear cases at 10 and 2. You see six months supervised probation. Yes, this is my case. Court employees truly are in the front lines of the court's business. This is especially true regarding confidential information about which court staff may become aware. Sometimes it's difficult for staff to know just what is off limits, which to take outside the court and to bring into the courthouse. Chief Judge Rock Hornby of the District of Maine feels strongly enough about these issues that his district developed guidelines for court staff. Our producer recently spoke with Judge Hornby about dealing with conflicts of interest and confidential information. Judge Hornby, it seems that the issues of conflicts and confidentiality are more important today than ever before, especially in the areas of financial transactions. What are your greatest concerns? Well, these days it seems far more likely that someone working for the court, may themselves or a spouse or a close relative, have stock ownership. That may be through an IRA, an independent retirement account. It may be through a spouse's retirement plan or through direct investments. Or it may be online trading that more and more people are engaging in. But the consequence is that it's far more likely that a corporate litigant before the court may be someone in which that person has a stock or an ownership interest. And that's what provokes the concern. What do court employees need to know about dealing with this information? Well, there are two major things. The first is the rule on insider trading. It can actually be a criminal offense. It can result in civil damages if somebody trades stock based on non-public information, inside special information, and that's something they might come into possession of through their work as a court employee. The second is, I think it's Canon 3F of the Canons of Ethics for Judicial Employees, which lays out fairly explicit guidelines that prohibit any involvement where someone has a financial interest. And indeed, it's specific, for example, with respect to case managers for a particular judge who's working on the case, that they should not be involved if, in fact, they have a financial interest in one of the parties. We also hear about the Bankruptcy Index Futures Contract. What is that, and how does it relate to court staff? Well, I don't purport to be an expert on futures trading, but as I understand it, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange does, in fact, offer futures that are based upon the daily and quarterly bankruptcy filings. Apparently, some companies find this a way to hedge against certain economic uncertainty in the future, and they make investments accordingly, but it's based upon information that comes from the courts. Let's talk about case information. Informal conversations and social situations can become a vehicle for uh, violating confidentiality. How are staff to know what they can say and what they can't say? It's a very difficult question. It's very difficult to know what can be said and what cannot be said. And so the best rule, in my judgment, is to say nothing. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about saying something you shouldn't. Employees might just say, well, I know it's not sealed, so I'll talk about it. And you know, what they're doing is giving somebody an advantage because without being aware of it, they're permitting a lawyer or a party to a lawsuit to have some information that wouldn't otherwise come to their attention until some other event has happened. Does the need for confidentiality work in reverse? Can it happen that staff bring back information related to your case? And how are they to know what's appropriate? That can happen as well. I know of an instance where I was presiding at a bench trial involving a discrimination claim against a company. Uh, one of my case managers happened to be in a social setting during a weekend recess, and her 
reports and information about that company. She then quite innocently told me about that uh, the next day of trial, but it was ex party information that the parties didn't know about it. I had to disclose it to them. The result was that I had to disqualify myself from the rest of the case in terms of how to proceed it. So yes, a person could be at a soccer game and could hear something. They could be in a social circumstance and hear something. Really what is needed is a set of procedures by which that person can report to a supervisor perhaps what they heard and document it, but not have it reported to the judge if in fact it's something that the judge did not hear in that kind of situation. Let me just say too, that happens to everybody. It happens to judges uh, as well as to court employees. I've been in instances where sitting in a barber shop and another barber will say, hey, aren't you about to sentence this friend of mine? And I have to quickly say, we can't talk about that. That can happen absolutely to anyone in any circumstance. I understand that the District of Maine has adopted uh, two sets of guidelines, one for investment policy and another on ex parte conversations with uh, counsel. Briefly describe what they cover. Well, the investment policy covers exactly what we've been talking about, which is to say, it describes what to do if an employee or a member of your family has ownership in a company that's before the court. It prohibits involvement in the bankruptcy keeping of contracts. Uh, it generally covers those issues and tells people what to do, report to a supervisor, exactly how it should be handled. Uh, the uh, other policy sets forth specific guidelines so that court personnel can know what to talk about and what not to talk about. And let's come back to that topic for a moment. You were asking earlier, isn't there information that a court employee has that they feel they might want to share? That, of course, comes up all the time during the course of their employment because they get a phone call from a lawyer or perhaps from a pro se litigant asking for information about a case. Clearly, case managers are expected to talk to those people. They're expected to give schedule information. They're expected to talk about matters of that sort. So what our guideline does is to make clear that that's permitted and expected, but to distinguish the confidential information, the information that's related to things that the judge is doing, or, for example, information that may have come in sealed. Uh, I know of another example where a case manager had access to sealed settlement memoranda. Uh, she later left the employment of the court, was hired by a lawyer, and in the course of that employment, some of that information came to that lawyer's attention where it could be used to the advantage in a pending lawsuit. It almost led to a mistrial or led to disciplinary proceedings against the lawyer. Again, that's the sort of thing that can take place. Judge Quincy, what led you to develop the guidelines and how did you go about doing it? In the case of the investment policy, it came about because I was contacted by one of my case managers who informed me that her husband, Curtis Ira, owned stock in a company that had a patent matter pending in front of it. That made me aware that it didn't have procedures and needed to develop procedures. And so as a result, the bankruptcy judge and the district judges got together to talk about the matter with our court union executives about the same time as Chicago Mercantile Exchange Bankruptcy Futures Trading Index was coming into being, and so we simply developed the proposal to follow the canons uh, and follow what's known as the KDO. The other policy, which has to do with the communications between case managers and litigants and lawyers, was something that our court union executives put together. They met among themselves. They then talked with their case managers and got input there, drafted the proposal, presented it to judges, and we then adopted it. And we're very happy with the result. As a case manager, I have a lot of contact with files that are sensitive. Um, some are sealed. Um, what I need to do is apply that policy, which, in fact, it's very clear. We don't talk about these things outside of work. And it's just something that becomes second nature. You know, you just don't talk about certain things, just like you wouldn't talk about personal things in your life with some people. You just sort of measure it. Judge Quinby, is there anyone taught? Do I court staff to remember when they're dealing with confidential information? These don't come up regularly. They're not frequent. But when they do come up, they're always crisis situations. And so they're better to have looked at in advance, to have an advanced understanding of what to do rather than have to be making decisions at the last moment. The second thing is that we in the judiciary have some very professional court employees who do an awfully good service to the judiciary, to the lawyers, for the parties, and really what this is is simply a matter of maintaining that professionalism so that the parties and litigants can continue to respect the same kind of integrity and assurance of that. Judge 
Carnegie, thank you again for being with us and sharing your insights about these important topics. Substance abuse issues play a major part in supervising defendants and offenders. Now, probation and pretrial services officers can get the latest information directly from national experts. This is among the most complex phenomena facing our society today. Live on the FJPN, the Federal Judicial Center presents Substance Abuse, a continuing education series which brings you the latest on research, policy, and strategies. Check the FJPN Bulletin or the JNET for air dates of the next edition of this provocative series. Be sure to watch Perspectives, a magazine program for probation and pretrial services personnel to bring you news on national issues affecting the system as well as your personal and international career. On location stories highlight innovative practices in districts large and small. You'll get the legal perspective from the AO's David Hill and the latest updates from the sentencing commission. Join us for Perspectives on FJTN. Check the FJTN bulletin or the JNET for dates and time. As more and more civil disputes have landed in federal courts, the court's calendars have become busier and busier. Indeed, some of the pressure and costs involved, courts are using alternative dispute resolution procedures. My colleague, Bob Fagan, will define what some of them are. Mike Fountain is not the problem. It, it is the problem. It is the problem. the chemicals in the ground. I mean, arguments and disputes. Sometimes the parties who disagree, whether individuals or organizations, can't resolve their differences. When they can, they may end up in costly litigation procedures, such as summary judgment motions or trials. In 1998, Congress passed legislation that requires each federal district court, in the words of the statute, to provide litigants in all civil cases with at least one process for alternative dispute resolution, often simply called ADR. Today we'll talk about three of the ADR procedures being mediation, arbitration, and early neutral evaluation. What we're really talking about here is helping the parties in a dispute work out their differences, often at an early stage in a case and often saving money. Mediation has emerged as the number one ADR technique used in the federal district courts, and about half of the 94 districts offer or require it. With this technique, a mediator helps the parties negotiate an agreement. All discussions are confidential. If an agreement is reached, it's an agreement that the parties themselves design. No decisions are made by mediators, who usually are attorneys approved by the court. But some magistrate and district court judges serve as mediators, as do other professionals, such as engineers or accountants in some courts. Typically, the process begins with the mediator and the parties meeting together, and each side having the opportunity to tell its story. This can be followed by private sessions with the mediator on each side, all aimed at reaching a mutually satisfying solution. Mediators can help the parties look beyond legal issues to see what their key interests are. That way, parties can create outcomes other than those which may be prescribed by law or awarded by a jury. The second most frequently used ADR technique in federal courts is arbitration. Unlike mediation, Arbitration addresses the factual and legal issues of the dispute, and legal standards apply. In other words, arbitration is an adjudicatory process that looks more like a trial, but it can occur earlier and at less cost than a trial. With arbitration, attorneys for each side present their arguments to an arbitrator, who's usually an attorney, often with experience in the subject matter of the case. The parties can submit exhibits and call witnesses would be done in a trial. And the arbitrator's decision is non-binding. The parties are free to proceed to trial if either is not satisfied with the decision. Another ADR technique is called early neutral evaluation. This process is used in about a dozen courts. With early neutral evaluation, also referred to as ENE, the parties meet early in a case with an evaluator. The evaluator is usually an attorney in private practice with experience of the subject matter of the case. Each party presents its side of the dispute, and the evaluator then gives an opinion of the strengths and weaknesses of each side's case. This assessment is non-binding, 
How do you want the evaluator also can assist with settlement decisions? Are we planning the next stages in the case if the parties prefer to move forward on the traditional litigation path? You can find out more about alternative dispute resolution techniques from this Federal Judicial Center source book, ADR and Settlement in the Federal District Courts. It's available to court staff, judges, and attorneys and explains the free ADR processes we've discussed today and others use less often. It also offers district-by-district district summaries of current ADR and settlement procedures for all 94 districts. That's words to know for this time. If there are any words you'd like us to discuss, please let us know. See you in the next Court Report. Thanks, Bob. Earlier in the program, we heard court staff talk about changes they've encountered in their offices. One thing that doesn't seem to change is the need to develop and promote communication skills. Despite advances in technology, management practices, and organizational structure, simply communicating with each other often sets the hardest task. So we keep studying that and working to improve it. In our next segment, we'll hear from someone who focuses on understanding personal style and communication. He calls it dealing with people who drive you crazy. We realize that we need each other. We all have blind spots. Well, in areas about ourselves that other people can see clearly, but we can't see. Joe Freeman spoke at a recent FJC-sponsored conference of bankruptcy court clerks and chief deputies. Freeman, a management consultant, referred to a recent study which concluded that 15% of one's career and financial success depends on technical competence. 85% of one's success is dependent on interpersonal skills. My passion is to help people understand their 85%. There are challenges wherever there are people working together. And some people are fast, some are slow, some are thinkers, some are doers. Uh, some people are task-oriented, some people are people-oriented. I think that so much of the breakdown of communication is just because we all see things differently, different personality styles, even has to do with generational differences, it has to do with gender differences, it has to do with religious affiliation differences, cultural diversity. And we get on each other's nerves just by being ourselves. There's no cosmic conspiracy out there. That's why this is such hard work, because we're just busy being ourselves, and sometimes it's hard to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else and understand why or what, what's going on with them. Myrna Atwater of the District of Connecticut Bankruptcy Court is eager to learn how personality affects communication style. Everyone is not really the way you see them. That there are that people have so many traits that it's good to see beyond the face. What I seek to help people understand is what the, the strengths and the vulnerabilities of style are, and so that the tools and skills come out of that awareness. Sylvia Reyes of the Western District of Tennessee wanted to understand her own communication. I'm always interested in seeing if there's a better way of dealing with people uh, and always trying to understand and be aware first of all of myself so that then therefore I can be a better, better open to what people are all about and their styles and so that we can work better together. Freeman uses the so-called DISC model of behavioral insights. These are the folks who are saying, tell me what to do and I'll, I'll do it. The name comes from four styles of behavior, dominance, influencing, steadiness, and correctness. In a small group breakout session, Freeman cautioned against judging any particular style. We're not talking about intelligent here, intelligence here. We're not talking about skills or education. Uh, we're talking about in behavior and emotions, and that's a very important thing to uh, understand. We're not, talk we're not even talking about values. Freeman had the participants work through the exercises, plotting graphs of their own behavioral styles. The second middle graph is what we call the, your instinctive response to stress, pressure, and conflict. He then discussed the nuances of how styles overlap within an individual. When it comes to a dominant people, you have the most aggressive people on the planet are dominant. The most passive people on the planet are steady. And when you bind that up into one person, you have kind of like a stop start, stop start, you know, like you have a... Uh... <laughs> the reason why there's internal stress is because you have...
someone who is aggressively going after something, and then they kind of like internally, the dialogue that goes on inside says, says, why am I doing this? Why am I pushing myself? And so you have that internal stuff happening a lot. Now, once a person harnesses that internal potential strife or uh, conflict, whatever you want to call it, there's an S genuinely, and I, my key word there is genuinely, is interesting people. The D, but the D keeps pushing, still pushing to the bottom line. The thing that struck me, struck me the most was the fact that when I did that little test, it ended up being the way that I, I saw myself. I think it's a good thing for people to see themselves. The, the greatest amount of internal conflict comes from ICCI combination. And the reason why is because uh, you have the I, which is extremely extrovert. Ah, how are you all? You know, it's a, you know here I am. Uh, you know, now we can begin the meeting. You know, it, the I is very expressive of, of what's what's going on inside, and uh, the C is very closed. The I C combination is that stop start stuff that's going on inside too, because here you have someone who is just social butterfly, but then pulled back into this contemplative, quiet, closed individual that you can hardly feel anything from. I believe that the buck also starts with you. Being more familiar and more aware of what I'm all about, I think that that helps in, in delivering information. By being aware and what I've learned from here, it would be easier for me to make sure that others understand what it is that I'm saying. Another chief deputy clerk, Bob Bacabello from the Northern District of Georgia, had concerns about communication between systems and operations staff. He said that for successful communication, each group had to get along. Freeman elaborated on that point, saying that the essence of communication is respect for each individual. Don't use this as an excuse to indulge your weaknesses. Don't use this information to categorize everyone you meet. The whole purpose of this is not to confine people in little boxes. It's to clarify. of each individual with each other and how much we treat each other with dignity and respect. That's quite a quote for this time. Your comments about today's program are valuable to us. Here's the Dana address to reach us. Click on Court to Court and then select Online Evaluation. There's a section where you can also tell us topics you'd like to see on future programs. Send the evaluation online or fill one out at your site and mail or fax it to us. Our fax number Two zero two five zero two four zero eight eight. On behalf of everyone here at the Federal Judicial Center, thank you for watching today. I'm Michael Burney. We'll see you in June for the next Court to Court.